Hello, and welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. We're going to have 20 minutes of shop talk and then 20 minutes of answering questions from you guys, the global audience. So please write in. Um, I am Liz Hinline. I am a film director and creative director at New York Film Academy. And I am so excited to have a genius producer with us, Carolina Grappa. She is brilliant and um, has lots of history and lots of things to talk about. So hello, Carolina. Hello, hello. Bravo. Happy Yay, we did it. Yay, we did it. I know you, um, you must have the same feeling I do because you've run this prolific series angle on producers like Will they show up? Will the tech work? Will it? <laughs> and then it does. You're like, that's magic. I know. And it's such a metaphor for like, you You always prep and do all the things. And there's always that one thing you couldn't have foreseen. Then you show up and you just have to like adapt in the moment. You know, it's such a great metaphor for life. I love your podcast slash YouTube series, Angle on Producers. It is so fascinating. And it's like, it's like letting the kids out of jail. Like finally all these producers get to like actually talk about like real things. And I just want to know where did that start from for you? Where did you get the idea and, and what were you trying to initiate with that? Yeah, thank you for asking and for watching and listening and all of the things. Um, it's, it's a truly a labor of love and it began because I, you know, pre-serial was an avid consumer of podcasts. And there were a few podcasts out there focused on the business, um, script notes, a lot of things for, for screenwriters, um, directors, a lot of actors with podcasts. But I felt this gap with producers. And in my own journey, I often was wondering like, well, how do they do that? And how do they get on this path? And they have this title. What does that mean? And what kind of producing is that? And, and having, even in my own career to often answer the question of like, well, you're a producer, what do you do exactly? And what does that mean? And, and it's such an amorphous term and it can mean so many different things throughout different sects of the business that it just became apparent that there was a gap in this knowledge. And I wanted to create a space where conversations could be had with producers that I admired um, in a way of like where we all want to pick someone's brain over coffee, my thinking was, well, if I can pick the brains of these incredible um, producers and share those conversations, maybe we can all learn from each other and create a sense of community around the journey and the struggle and to really highlight the realities of the lifestyle of what it takes to do this work because producers have, uh, there's a lot of stigma around it. And there is this idea that there's this romantic idea that producers either have all the money or make all the money or just hang out on red carpets with celebrities all the time. And the reality behind the scenes is quite different. So I really wanted to have these conversations, not to dissuade anyone, but to empower them so that they would know the realities of what they're stepping into. And that still really rewarding career, but you know, there's just a lot of realities that I didn't know when I was starting out. And it's the, the show I wish I had when I was starting out. And how did you, how did you know that producing was for me? Cause everybody usually wants to go into the director's seat and they're like, that's, you know, that's the head honcho, the director. But yeah. Reality, yeah, exactly. It's interesting because I've never been bit by like that director's bug ever since I started producing. Uh, I came into producing as, as an actor initially. Um, I had moved out to LA and spent about three years in the pavement. This is like 06, you know, before YouTube started. And so waiting around for the phone to ring was a real thing and waiting for someone else to give you an opportunity. And that kind of really drove me crazy. And so I started producing to create opportunities for myself as an actor because I recognized no one was going to give me that opportunity, especially as a as a Latina and, and as an ethnically ambiguous Latina, which they could say at the time where I wasn't white enough or Latina enough for some roles. And so when I discovered producing, it just became apparent that like, oh, I didn't know there was like a title for this because this is just how I've been my whole life. And to me, what that meant was someone who thrives in chaos, who really loves learning new things, who's endlessly curious, loves the process, like loves learning the process of certain things and really wants to just understand how the machine works and and frankly the illusion of control but yes you know when you are producing you have a lot you're the person constantly putting balls in people's courts and kind of waiting back versus what i felt like my journey as an actor at the time had been is just waiting for someone to give me a ball and i just was not about to play that game <laughs> to keep with that metaphor you know i really wanted to empower myself and so 
when I discovered it, I just fell in love with like, wow, like there's so many people that are required to create this magic and really understanding how the whole process of filmmaking specifically came to be endlessly fascinated me in ways that I felt more fulfilling than getting to be um, an actor who has a very pivotal part of the filmmaking process, but a small part really when you consider everything else that everyone else does, but it is one of the more visible parts, right? Um, and similarly with directing, I just, I guess I just never felt like that was the path for me at that point, but, you know, I'm obviously open to getting bit by that bug and eventually finding my own footing in that space if it's where I'm meant to be, but producing has been really rewarding so far, so. Now, have you produced anything that you've acted in? I have. So there was a couple of things that when I started producing, it was to learn how to produce so I could create opportunities for myself. And I always thought, well, if Hollywood isn't going to give me the shots that I want, then I'm going to just create them through the backdoor entrance of producing, you know? So there were a couple of short films. The most notable is a short called Gina and Jules that I produced and co-wrote with my best friend, who was also an actor at the time. And, you know, we got into some pretty great film festivals and it was a really rewarding experience. But the lesson that I learned is that, you know, producing a short or do preparing anything for a short, directing a short, it's as the same amount of work as a feature, except you get there and you only have a day or two. And what one of my shortcomings in that experience was I was so focused on making sure the production was going to run smoothly that I didn't give myself the opportunity to play as an actor. Mm -hmm. Like we get there and just have like very limited time to do the takes. And so it's like, wow, we've spent like eight months preparing for this moment. And now I have like zero time to do the work that is the fun part of the process. So, um, so definitely learned that lesson, but it's still something that I think about revisiting at some point, you know, I think it would be fun to get to play and get to just dip my toe back in that sandbox for, for the right opportunities, but not necessarily a leading um, part of my life anymore. Well, it's definitely left brain, right brain. Like part of your brain's like, no, we have to be on time, on budget. And the other brain is like, 100%. Is creative. And I, and we have to, we, we need another take to delve into stuff. Yeah. What do you find, like if you were going to talk to different filmmakers and they're saying, I am, you know, I'm looking for a producer. What, what should they be looking for in reality that, you know, in their sort of looking for a producer situation? Yeah, I think it depends on a couple of things. Like, where are you at in your career? And when you when you say you want a producer, what is exactly that you need? I would encourage a filmmaker to write down a list of like, what is this person doing? What kind of support are they giving you? Some people say they want a producer. They just mean they want someone to give them the money to make a, a project. When someone says they want a producer, they want a creative partner to help execute some of their ideas and help bring that into reality because some director, writer, directors are super creative brain. Some have a little bit of that business brain. So it just depends on the person. But I think the most important thing that I've learned and that I, I talk about a lot on the podcast and with anyone that wants to listen to me ramble on is being really intentional and specific with what it is that you want to create, the kind of filmmaker you want to be, because it's not just like, I just need a producer. There is a specific producer that is for you and it is a creative marriage. And so you got to date around and kiss a lot of frogs before you before you find your person and any successful filmmaking team that you can look to now and see a success story reflected oftentimes the producer was someone who has been with them from from the jump who has been with them from day one right who has believed in them from the very beginning and you find those relationships through just a genuine connection on a human level first and foremost but then secondly that marriage of like this person has a skill set that is complementary to what I need so really understanding what it is you need will help you find that person that is a great collaborator for you and understanding that sometimes it takes time to find the right person I think it's no different than any metaphor and analogy you want to make to romantic relationships and dating you know it just takes time to find that person that is a click for you but once you find that person to me, that's where the best art comes from. And I also think that there is a huge advantage to producers who have come up in a more creative side because they understand artists. They understand the art side of things. You know, they understand the creative process and can really help you by not being the, the stereotypes of a producer, being a no person. But uh, how, do we, how do we find a solution for this? It's not that we want to say no, but we don't have the money for what this wants it to be. So what is the solve, right? Right. And some of the best creativity has come out of filmmakers being backed into corners and having to figure out how to get themselves out. So having a person that's going to support you and amplify you when you're backed up into a corner versus, you know, 
kind of giving you more reasons to stay there is is exactly the kind of partner I would recommend people will find. And what do you have any good stories about being getting out of that corner? Oh my gosh. I mean, for myself, I think that, you know, I've been really lucky that I have had a lot of people come through my career and help me in moments of like points of inflection in my own journey, but, but they weren't necessarily people that at the time I would have said, oh, these are mentors, or this is someone who's like changing the course of my career. But, um, but a lot of it has come from my own like anxiety and frustration with like wanting to learn and wanting to like meet people because I didn't go to any film schools. I didn't have the privilege of coming out with the network. And so I had to really create that network for myself. And how I did it is I just would look at the people that were creating the kinds of projects that I loved. Like what got me into the business? What are the movies that I go back to when I'm feeling you know down or energetically depleted or emotionally depleted? And who are the producers actually responsible for making those projects? And so I started to find who those people were and start to develop relationships with them. And they helped kind of get me out of these corners uh, professionally here and there, but it didn't come from sitting around and waiting. And it also didn't come from some of these more traditional networking kind of events. It came from, again, like really being intentional. That's a word I use a lot. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can, it, we have such limited energy. So if you do this like approach where you're just throwing spaghetti at the wall, like what are you going to get back? Right. But if you're taking the time to do your research and be really specific with what you want, like it may take a little longer, but when you get that back, it's going to be so much sweeter um, and just put you on a course. Like you may be slow here, but when you go out, when you, you get out further ahead in the long run, you know, totally. I love how so being proactive and being like yeah. initiative and, and, and saying hi, producer who I admire. Da, 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 da. Do you exactly. um, have you transformed into because I know you've done UPM? Like, do you consider yourself when you describe yourself as a producer? How do you do you? Um, I describe shape? myself. Yeah, I describe myself as a physical producer first and foremost, as a person who knows execution. Like, I've come up really intentionally and I use that word a lot so you know you can do a transcript and see how many times you should say the word intention <laughs> but you know I deliberately wanted to not get stuck or pigeonholed into one sect of the business so when I started out I was doing commercials and branded projects um, I did digital series web series I did feature docs I did feature films and that was by design because I always wanted to be able to play in the different sandboxes and speak the different languages but it also felt like boot camp for production you know because if like a feature takes so long well in a commercial you have limited amount of time depending on the budget limited resources so that ability to scale up and down up and down has made me a really strong physical producer and sometimes there is this um people like when they say they want to be a producer they would say they want to be a creative producer and there's so much creativity in being the person who holds the purse strings who's the line producer and understands physical production to say hey actually no let's go to this location or let's pivot here if we swap these days like there's a lot of creativity that comes with that and when filmmakers trust that i think it's much easier for you to hop the fence and then become a a tried and true creative producer once you have this really solid foundation on the physical side. So nowadays that's what I consider myself. I'm now that I'm in house at Color Creative, it's leaning on all of that physical production to, to leverage what I'm building, but also be a support to filmmakers as I get to now step into more of a creative producer, capital P producer role, but I can roll up my sleeves at any time and get in the trenches with the team and not not a lot of producers can say that unfortunately unless they really come up on the indie side and mm -hmm. really just immersed in the um unglamorous part of what really it is to be a producer <laughs> so are you now going between indie and studio or or where where are you playing in now do you find so right now i'm in a whole new territory whole new chapter of my career because whereas i've been a general contractor for most of my career right getting to produce projects for other people i now get to be an architect because i'm building the framework and infrastructure for Isare's production company and figuring out once we take those projects into production what is that set going to be like? How are we going to run those sets? So now I get to kind of help deploy people that will run sets in the way that I know they can be ran, um, obviously from a place of inclusion and diversity, but more importantly, from a place of 
love and support, not to sound woo woo, but of course production is production. It's very hard, but I know there's still a way to navigate that from a place of um, generosity, you know, and, and making sure specifically for me that the crew is taken care of. Um, because that's where I came up. I came up in the trenches with the crew and it takes a really special kind of person to sign up for a life where they're going to be working for forever. It seems like, <laughs> you know, going from job to job, often at the behest of their own relationships, their own health to support writer, directors and producers in bringing their projects to life. And it takes a specific, very special kind of human to want to do that. And so I really empower filmmakers to really value their department heads and their crew and their collaborators early on, because as you rise up, you'll start to realize once you don't have those solid relationships, typically when you have weak links in your production, that's kind of what it comes down to, you know? So it's really important. Yes, yeah. well, you find if the crew is against you, you're done. Like, you know, they move, doesn't matter how much they're being paid. They're moving slow. Exactly. And I, and I like to think like everyone on the crew is a collaborator in that process. Mm -hmm. Like even a PA and I'd, I'd say a PA is one of the most important people on your support team, because if they are terrible, every aspect of production will feel that. And, you know, you want to have like, everyone gets into this business because they love the, they love films and TV. They love stories, right? No one wakes up and goes, wow, I can't wait to be a grip one day. Like, you know, they, they, they find the ways that they can support creating stories and that's mm -hmm. the gift that they bring. So they are an important collaborator. And I think once you create a space where people feel that as opposed to transactional, even right. though, yes, it's just a job, but for these 30 days or this amount of time, we're creating something special. I think once you bring that energy from the top down, the response that you get and the experience you create for everybody is so much more rewarding. A hundred percent. You know, I always see, you know, it, it comes from the army. It's very Piscean, the way a set usually is run. Like I step on you, yeah. me, blah, blah, blah. And, and I have always been trying to still in, in the culture is like, A, it's not the blame game, you know, yeah. that like they, you know, trying, because that sets become, can become, you know, nasty high school very quickly. Um, yeah. And how does everyone feel like a valued member of the team? And then yeah. in an Aquarian way, which we're all sort of supporting and adding and which that, that sort of comes from the infrastructure of, of gaming, like everybody shared, right. you know, coding basically now. And that right. is the generation that does that. It's not you work for me, but we need to create this together and how we Correct. need to get together. And it's high stakes. It's like one of the hardest things because it's an inherently creative process. This business is absolutely emotional, you know, the emotional aspect of making a project. You have people operating, firing from all cylinders at a limited window of time when for those, for that amount of time, that's all that matters. You've waited years, if you're the filmmaker, to get to this amount of time where you get to actually make your project. And so everything is at a high level. And so the best advice is like people who can navigate that understanding different people's personalities, how they're going to be triggered in high stress situations. All of the, the nuances of that is, I think, what makes production so challenging, but so rewarding once you kind of figure out that dynamic. And it's why it's, it's like a blueprint you sort of know, but every time you have a new team, it's a bunch of new humans and you have to understand how to speak different languages sometimes to different people to say the same thing. Um, so being like a people person to an extent is huge and having those social skills, um, is a really important part, I think, of the success that one finds these days. A hundred percent. I'm going to jump yeah. into some questions because uh, oh, yeah, like, yeah. lots of questions. Um, uh, so Veronica asked to confirm, would you say that a physical producer is more logistics oriented? Um, or is this a term used interchangeably with creative producers? This is very specific in the vocabulary of yeah. the laid now. Yeah, I would absolutely say that when someone says they're a physical producer, there's a lot more logistics involved. They've usually done that job. They've come up typically working in physical production through the production office like I did. Um, and there is very big difference between a person who can look at a script and know exactly how much that page is going to cost them and how long it's going to take to shoot that versus a producer who's looking at that those same pages from a story perspective and character work, right? Which is also really important. But ideally, both of these people exist in one. 
But I think once producers became a, a wider sort of spread job with different skill sets, which is great, it created a lot more jobs. But I would venture to say that a lot of people who've come up on mostly on the development side, generally when they step on a set, feel a bit of anxiety because they don't really know what's going on. Now, if they've been doing this for a decade, they learn enough that now they know. But if they had to hop in the hot seat and be like a lead producer on a project, like an indie, it would be really challenging for them if they didn't have a bit of that of that knowledge. Yeah. Did you ever balance, balance yourself with someone who's more like a producer, writer or storyteller? Did you have partnerships like that? Or were you always on your own? Kind of always on my own. The The strongest partnership I've had was with a, a lovely producer named uh, Elizabeth Hughes, who did Short Term 12 and was one of those people I was talking about earlier, which was one of my favorite movies. And I was like, how do I get to create these kinds of stories? And when we met, you know, she is very much a line producer and she's very, very good with the line producing, but it wasn't really her, her love to really deal with crew and dealing with the people side of the business. And so when we came together, it became really apparent that I could navigate this and she could just do this. And so we were a really good team, even though I could do both and she could do both. There were parts that we each enjoyed a little bit more. And so that would be the closest thing to that. But, um, but as I've now sort of been working with more filmmakers and, and, um, and other producers, there's definitely been a handful of those, but if, you know, because I've gone in house now, it's like a little bit of that kind of that FOMO of like certain things kind of get to be stopped for a bit. So, yeah. What do you find what muscles now that you're more of an executive what muscles are are being flexed with with this new venture it's more of um ideation you know i think my whole career like i was saying earlier i've been execution focused like you can drop me off anywhere and give me a timeline and i know exactly what needs to be done by when and i'm just so used to high volume and high stress because that's all i've known for like 14 years so now to be an executive where the biggest joke I have is I, I'm used to doing things and now I talk about doing things, you know, um, and that is like the best metaphor for executives. And there's nothing wrong with that. We need people that are out there meeting and sort of business sort of orchestrating the macro level of everything that trickles down to the execution. But it's been really fascinating to learn. I feel like I'm getting my master's on the business side of our business now that I'm an executive and the, the relationship aspect of it is so important once you're over on this side where it, yes, it's important when you're on the ground as well, but it's a completely different network of people versus now knowing other executives and buyers and financiers and agents and like navigating all of that, the, the sort of political side of navigating all of that is a different skill set and muscle that is just as draining in a different way than production, <laughs> frankly. And where, how did that opportunity come about for you? It's honestly through my podcast, uh, believe it or not. I think that, you know, I had had um, Denise Davis, who is Issa Rae's producer on the show. She was one of the first people I pursued because I had been assessed, obsessed, with, obsessed with Issa and her journey and Insecure and mm -hmm. wanted to know this one producer's journey. And she was one of the first guests I had, gosh, in 2018. And we just stayed in touch. And I think when this opportunity came up, they were looking for someone who maybe came up from a different path than mm -hmm. any a production executive that existed at a studio. And Denise kind of hit me up and was like, we have this opportunity and I think you would be right for it. Would you ever consider going in house? And it had always been something I had thought about, but never had the courage to do because for as hard as the freelance life is, I had finally in the previous five years pre pandemic, you know, really found my footing and was really happy with the kinds of jobs and the breaks that came between jobs. Like I was just happy where I was, but was looking to elevate and learn and had been focused on, all right, this is when I want to now focus more on creative producing, which the pandemic gave me that opportunity to really start pushing some po projects forward. Um, but it just became a no brainer to take all of the things that are important to me, that are the reason why I'm here and why I do this and getting to do that now with Issa, with, there's so much synergy from a holistic level that it just became a no-brainer that if I were ever to go in-house for anyone, Issa Rae would be that person. And okay. so it's been um, eight months now I've been in with, with them and it's been an incredible uh, ride so far. That's awesome. Shoshana asks, other than the story itself, when you are considering taking on a project, what do you view as a green flag or a red flag about a project or filmmaker attached to the project? Good question. 
green flags. I filmmakers who are passionate. I, I want to see a writer director who's going to stop, not stop by, you know, basically go to the ends of the earth to make this project. It's like, why should this story exist in a mm -hmm. world where there's so much content to watch and so much to hear? And like, there's just so much, right? Why are you telling this story? Why does it matter? And if you don't have that clear for you and you're going to basically be unstoppable, then why should I attach myself to you and to supporting you? Because producers don't get paid until you go into production. Very true. You know, so that would be a huge green flag for me. And red flag is, is the sort of the counter to that is someone who's expecting a producer to just do magic behind the scenes and they don't have to lift a finger and their producer is just going to make it all happen. Um, that's not quite how it works, especially when you're talking about the independent side of things and you're starting out in your career. It's a team effort. Um, and so that's why it's so important to have someone you have clear communication with that you trust in that relationship as you navigate. Yeah. What are you seeing with the industry now post pandemic? What's the vibe on the street? I think the vibe is that people are excited uh, for theatrical again, which is super exciting. We're just having a conversation with an executive about Cannes and just like how, you know, the appetite for buyers. I think there's a lot of, of interest, but it's like the expectation of how you need to show up and deliver and the quality is higher than it's ever been. So there's more opportunity than ever, but there's also like packages have to come in. It's like in a way a different type of heart. It's like really great, but also just as hard as it's ever been. Um, but I think people are starting to feel optimistic again about mm. the state of things. And, you know, with uh, Top Gun doing so well in the box office, there seems to be a good energy and Stranger Things doing well for Netflix. That's that's a good, really good win for them. Um, after I'm sure everybody saw a couple weeks ago, so many people were laid off after the uh, the numbers didn't come in where they wanted. So I think that's one of the good things. Um, but one of the, the threats and the challenges, which I know you didn't really ask, but that's been on my mind lately is um, how we are in direct competition with TikTok, you know? And mm -hmm. TikTok is, uh, I was reading a fascinating article that's also terrifying, but that's just the reality is that, you know, TikTok is like 50 times large. The, the TikTok creator community is something like 50 times larger than the entire film industry, international film industry combined. Wow. And it doesn't cost anything because it's just creators creating at home. And so we are competing with the new generation that's coming up under us um, that is going to grow up on this kind of content. And what is that going to do for traditional film and television? That's something I've been thinking about often and and does that mean that the scripts to you does that mean the scripts have to get more like that or you just keep having the voices and you're talking about audience that is being yeah is the split I, the audience I think there's a split I think like you know people have already said that younger generations have a harder time focusing so like asking them to sit for 30 minutes to watch something and be focused is really really hard because your brain isn't fully formed until you're 25. So if you're getting hit with constant dopamine and the TikTok algorithm is such that, you know, you literally, it's so good that it's catered to you specifically. So all the videos it recommends are things you actually want to watch. And so right. you can easily stay there. And, and to, their, to their testament, they did add a feature that encourages kids to like go outside and drink water, which is like <laughs> terrible that they have to even put that on there. But, the but yeah, my, my curiosity is like, you know, will there be this, new wave of of people that are going to want a story told in like 10 minutes um or is that just the pop sort of thing that the younger kids are doing but there'll always be an appetite for longer format stories mm -hmm. i like to believe yes because stories are what keeps us alive as a human race and what keeps us going and so while tiktok i think can be really fun in a lot of ways it doesn't really engage you in a narrative that takes mm -hmm. you on a journey and i still think as humans we're going to always crave that. I'm just curious if like, we'll have to tell hour long stories in 30 minutes somehow, <laughs> you know, just a bunch of scenes flashing, uh, which I hope doesn't happen, but. Are you still seeing a, a division between like the studios and the, so the Marvels and then the indie, like is, is money going in between there? It's one or the other. Um, I think that there's, 
a few studios uh, and some buyers very much still focus on independent stories, independent filmmakers. What's ironic is that if you think about it, um, the indie scene has become almost like indie producers are like scouts for the studios, you know, because we're the ones that go out there and invest time and energy developing a filmmaker. Then they go to Sundance, win Sundance, and now Marvel taps them and here they are directing their first movie. Um, so it's like everyone says they want like a filmmaker with a vision and tastes and like undeniable blah, blah, blah. Well, you don't really get that generally speaking unless that person's come up independently creating their work, right? Like writer directors specifically who have a really strong vision and lens that they bring into the world. That's what everybody wants, right? right? So I do think there's like a lot of appetite for that, but you know, there's that big divide of like, it's now either you're making hundred million dollar movies or it's like sub 20. And there's like really very few projects in between, whereas that used to be the norm um, and kept a lot of people employed. It's why you see so many actors now, movie actors traditionally doing television because that's where the money is. 100%. Um, I wanted to get to, oh, uh, Henrique asked, when I start my first production, I assume as a producer, what skills are most important? Definitely line producing, understanding budget, uh, psychology 101, knowing how to talk to people, knowing how to get what you want from people. I think there's a way, a, a, an aspect of being a leader that is, I don't wanna use the word manipulative, but you need something from your teammates and not every tactic works for everybody. Some people need you to be direct. Some people need a little bit of warm and fuzziness around it or they get hurt, right? And instead of you being ups upset by that fact and that reality, it's just embracing that you're going to have to try different techniques to get what you want to corral a bunch of humans, even if it's 10 people to come make a short or a hundred people to make a thing, like it's still the same amount of, of uplift. So that, and then, um, really making sure that you take time to check in with yourself because a lot of producers are so busy with outputting of energy that they don't recharge themselves. And I, 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 might, I have a belief that that's what makes people usually really bitter and cynical mm -hmm. because I was saying it's a really emotional business. And so if you don't have a healthy way to release that, whether it's through yoga or running or bubble baths or whatever your thing is, just that resets you to get up and you know do the job again, you're going to start to build this angst and frustration that then becomes really hard to um, let go of because you're dealing with humans and you're dealing with art and that those are two very different things to deal with very hard and then you put them together it's challenging so taking care of yourself so you can show up and be the best version of you is definitely uh those those three things are definitely my like big advice and who's your important hires? Is it the AD? Who are the things that 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 you either bring your people along or you're really yeah. careful with who who you select? The, 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 the line producer's best friends will be your accountant and your first AD. Those are your most important hires if you're talking about a feature film. And then I would take it a step further and say the DP is like, one of the most important hires because the DP controls three different departments. They have camera at G&E, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you have a DP who doesn't understand, who's brilliant, but doesn't understand the scope of what you're trying to do and the budget of what you're working within, then that's going to trickle down to all the departments. And all of a sudden you have this massive problem because you know, you know, you have a limited uh, budget to do something and the DP now only knows how to work in this way because they've only done big budget commercials and they've never done an indie and they really want to do their first narrative project, <clears throat> excuse me, but they don't know how to necessarily scale down. So when you're talking to people, DP specifically and interviewing them is really posing these questions to them. Well, I see your work is blah, 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 but if you only had this amount of money and time to do it and I could only give you this amount of crew and support, like walk me through how you would do that. That's a great, that's a great way to look at it because I think that's where if you're, but that's also going back to no, understanding the languaging of each exactly. department. And, and it's not coming out, it's saying, no, it's saying, hey, like, here's what I've got. Tell me what you need. But mm -hmm. within the parameters of what I can give you, like, do you feel like you're going to be set up for success? And if not, totally fair. We got to find someone who can work within these parameters, right? So there's always ways to navigate conversations that are hard and challenging from a place of like, 
collaboration. Like, Hey, here's a problem. Like I can't change the budget. I can't like make right. more money up here, right. but right. I want this to work. So how do we find a solution? Right. And when you come at it from this collaborative space, people generally will meet you very collaboratively and put on their thinking caps to go, okay, I see what you're saying. So I can't have a crane, but what else could I do to get this shot that I want? Right. And then you're, you're, you're off to the races. A hundred percent. So we're nearing the end. Um, I would love if, where can people find you? Where can they watch angle on producers? Where can that all happen? Yeah. So I'm very Googleable. Um, I'm at Carolina Gropa on Instagram and Twitter, et cetera, but I really am mostly active on IG these days. Um, and yeah, Angle on Producers is the show. There is an Instagram page for it. I kind of publish once a month these days because I'm a one woman band doing the show, like I said, as a passion project while still working full time. Another thing by design, I wanted to be an active working producer talking to other producers. Um, so, which is why I've been maintaining ways to find the show. Um, but on angleonproducers.com, you can see all the episodes that have passed. It's also on Spotify and Apple. And then since the remote world, you know, I started recording during the pandemic over Zoom very much like this. So for the people that love to see two people talk, um, that's also available on YouTube. But, um, you know, I recommend if you like the show, it, we are small, we just me, small and growing. So please share it with your community. If you post about it, tag me. I love to reshare and know that the show is resonating with people um, and constantly looking for other conversations I can be having with other producers. So if anyone has burning questions and things they want to know or people that they're, that's been on their radar that they'd love to have me try to get them as a guest, like I would love to know who, who those people are. That's amazing. Well, you were just like a fountain, like, a, <laughs> like, like turn the button on. It's like, woo! you're like a, a fantastic fountain of knowledge and brilliance. Thank you. It's so exciting to have you on the show. Um, Thank you so much for having me and, and to all the students that I can't see and all the people that participated. Thank you for taking time out of your day, your Wednesday to come hear me babble on a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know your thing and you have such a, a just such a, just a beautiful um, viewpoint and a really inclusive and really powerful and, and positive, which is so. Thank you. Exciting. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you, New York Film Academy for presenting the 2020 series and everyone be safe and have a great summer and talk to you guys later. Thank you, Carolina. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye everyone.